Shuttle is back on. The shuttle is fueled. It has been on launch pad 39B at Cape Canaveral all morning. And the crew is on board. And now Mother Nature is cooperating to make possible the launch yeah, of the shuttle discovery. The first launch for the shuttle program during 1989. The shuttle launch window opened at 8.07 a.m. Eastern Time this morning. But because of problems with the winds and fog in the area, the launch was put on nearly a two-hour hold. There was about a 500-foot uh, thick cloud of fog covering the uh, launch site, which made it difficult for the shuttle to return back to uh, Cape Kennedy should uh, an emergency landing be necessary. The crew has been on board the shuttle inside the orbiter since about 5.30 this morning Eastern Time. It is uh, probably getting uncomfortable for them, but the uh, systems have all been checked out and the weather conditions are such that a launch is now possible. NBC science correspondent Bob Bazell is at Cape Canaveral this morning, along with Al O'Hara, who is a former launch director for the shuttle program, and both have been on board for a number of these launches. Bob, good morning. Good morning, Deborah. Everything is going very well this morning, except for the weather, which has gone away. Al, this is one of the smoothest countdowns we've had in a long time, isn't it? It has been. Very smooth. We're really looking forward to a great launch. One of the things that happened was that the crew was getting a little antsy out there. They were giving the launch director, Bob Seek, uh, a lot of trouble this morning. They were. It's a little unusual, but I guess they're anxious to go, and uh, so was everyone else. Okay, so the only problem was the weather. We're coming up now in, on T-minus four minutes. The ground launch sequencer, which is a computer, is taking over and it's giving all the commands. That's, That's correct, right. Now, one of the key moments that we always look for in a launch is that we move towards T-minus 31 seconds. At that, at that moment, the computer that's on board the Discovery will take over and give all, all the commands. The five-man crew is standing by. A lot of things are automatic now. It's, this, this is all by the book, right? That's right. They're sitting there waiting for everything to take place and left off will be automatic unless they're just stopped for some reason. The, one of the things, uh, Deborah, that's happening this morning is that uh, the voice of launch control for the first time in history of the space program is a woman, a woman named Lisa Malone, who works for NASA's Public Affairs Office. We might listen to her for a second. Well, she's not saying anything right now, but we see the, the countdown moving up on three minutes now. But that's the main three engines three there. Three minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. We are right now, now the... transferring to internal power and switching off the orbiter's ground support equipment power bus. At this point, Discovery's running off its onboard fuel cells. A minute ago, you saw the engines moving around there. That's a routine test to, to see that the engines can move properly. Yes, Bob, to make sure that all the automatic equipment is operating properly, and when it lifts off, the engines will be able to operate right. You've, all automatic. you've been in charge of this a few times. What's going through your mind when you're making the decisions to whether to launch? Nervous, anxious, hope it's successful, pray that it will be. And uh, that's how we are. Uh, Deborah, we should also point out that this is the first launch of this year and the first of seven of a very ambitious schedule, including three very important science missions. This particular flight will carry a $100 million communication satellite, which is crucial for the rest of the space program. It's called the Tracking Data. Uh, data and relay satellite. There's also some biology experiments on board to measure the growth of chicken embryos and plants and rats that have artificially broken legs to see if bones will hear in space. That's the beanie that you see coming off the top of the external tank now. That's the thing that puts the liquid hydrogen and oxygen into the huge external tank. That's the main fuel along with the solid fuel that's in the booster rockets. Everything going exactly according to plan. Uh, Bob, I understand that uh, Mr. O'Hara has been part of many of these missions before, as you mentioned. Uh, it struck me today that there seemed to be an awful lot of consultation with not only the people from NASA, but uh, also officials from some of the uh, companies that are involved with some of these scientific experiments. There was a group decision to go ahead with this, this launch. That's right. It's always a group decision, and even more so now since the Challenger disaster. Right? You're taking a lot more precautions, a lot more people thinking harder about these things. Absolutely. Right Nothing has remained uh, uncovered. They want to bring everything to the surface, make a conscious decision to go or no go. Very different. But as we said, the only problem this morning was the weather. The weather this morning was very foggy here at Cape Canaveral. It's now, it's now a beautiful day here. It's now for the launch of Discovery and its five-member crew. About a minute away for the uh, ground computers to give the uh, orbiter computers the uh, go-ahead and take over. That's right. Uh, we're going to listen from now on, Deborah. but that is the crucial moment to watch is that T-minus 31 seconds. T-minus one minute, the heaters on the booster joints okay. will be deactivated. Just seconds away now from liftoff of Discovery. All systems are go.
coming up on T minus 31 seconds. We have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's four redundant computers have primary control of critical vehicle functions for the remainder of the count. T minus 20 seconds. 15 seconds. T minus 13, 12, 11, 10. We have a go for main engine start. Six, five. We have main engine start. Three, two, one. SRB ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of STS-29 as Discovery clears the tower. Roll program. A Roger roll, Discovery. Mission Control, Houston. Good roll program confirmed. Engines now at 65 percent. Standing by for the go with throttle up call. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Special control, that call means all systems are performing well as the shuttle main engines have resumed their. Uh, Firing at 104% of rated thrust. Relative velocity now 2,400 feet per second. Climbing at a rate of 1,700 feet per second. Downrange distance 11 nautical miles. SRB separation standing by for a performance call from Mission Control. Discovery, performance, nominal. And nominal. Roger, nominal performance. As a that call. call indicates Discovery's performance uh, was good on the first stage uh, with the solid rocket booster performance. Uh, now I have three main engines up and running at 104%, three good fuel cells, three good APUs, altitude. Uh, Bob Bazell, we're hearing the uh, mission control uh, people say that it's looking good to them. I imagine it's the same uh, to you and Al O'Hara there. Yeah, that was really a beautiful launch because once the fog lifted here, Deborah, it was it's a perfectly clear day here in Florida, and we can still see the thing. If you look up in the sky, you can still see the engines burning as little pins in the in the sky. It was really quite a quite a sight. Beautiful, just beautiful launch. Yeah. We keep hearing the word nominal from Mission Control in Houston, and of course, nominal is exactly what you people want, right? Yes, right. Nominal means means normal, it means perfect, and it, this was a very good launch. Interestingly enough, this is the first shuttle flight for three of the crewmen who are on board the Discovery shuttle. There are about 45,000 people there on the ground, along with uh, you, Bob Bazell, and Al O'Hara watching. That's right. There was a lot of people who lined the freeways around here in Central Florida this morning, and there are cars, Winnebago's, and trucks. So a lot of people came out to watch the launch. It's still, it's still a big tourist attraction for a lot of people who haven't seen it. And I'll tell you, it's a great thing to come and see if you haven't seen it. Don't you uh, agree? You never, never get used to it. Every launch is different, and it's exciting. Well, you both have pretty good seats for it, I must say. Right now, we are still at a point where the shuttle could return uh, to the Cape. Uh, after we had just uh, passed that point at uh, four minutes into the flight, the shuttle now will not be able to return back to Cape Kennedy, uh, Cape Canaveral, and make a uh, 
an emergency landing there. It has reached the point of what they call negative return, which means it must continue on across the Atlantic. To well, Deborah, yeah, Deborah, what's happened is that starting with this mission, they, ha they have the emergency landing site across the Atlantic, as they always have had. They also have an emergency landing site in Bermuda, which is a new thing that's programmed into a computer. There's three possible emergencies from now on until they, in the next hour or so, until they get into orbit securely. If, if they were to lose one of the main engines, they could come back to Bermuda, they could land in Morocco, or they could go once around the world and land at, uh, in New Mexico this time, in Northrop Airship in White Sands, New Mexico. None of that, of course, is, seems to be happening at the perfect flight, but those are the contingency plans that have worked out. This is what uh, Shuttle Chief Dick Frewley said is really an absolutely vital mission to the shuttle program. NASA has a goal of getting a shuttle up once a month as of 1992. It's important that this mission go as planned and that this uh, tracking satellite, which you mentioned earlier, be successfully deployed. Well, that's true, Deborah. This, this is, is a tough year for NASA. Uh, because they're, they're going to try to get seven missions off. And if this one hadn't gone this week, and it was already almost a month late, uh, they would have possibly had to bring it off the pad because there's another mission that goes in April, which is a planetary uh, spacecraft that's going to go to Venus off the shuttle. If that hadn't gone off, that, that has to go in a very narrow window. So they were under a lot of pressure here, but they got it off. Al, do you think they're talking about seven missions this year? One time, of course, a long time ago, NASA was talking about 20 missions a year. Do you think the seven missions is a realistic goal? It's going to be very close, but I think it's achievable if everything falls in place. And as you said, Bob, this is a year that, that the scientists are going to gain so much information from the two interplanetary missions. And of course, the end of the year with the space telescope, it's got to be the most exciting mission of the last few years. Yeah. Really. The space, uh, space telescope will be fantastic. Deborah? Bob, there are five uh, people who are on board the uh, shuttle Discovery, and while we uh, wait for the next important stage in this flight, let's take a look at who they are. The commander of the ship is Michael Coates who was the uh, pilot uh, on Discovery before. He discovered back in 1984 on its maiden voyage. He's been an astronaut since uh, 1979. Interestingly enough, um, Judy Resnick was on that flight of Discovery with him. The pilot of the ship is uh, John Blaha. This is his first flight in space, though he did fly a number of missions in combat in Vietnam. He's been an astronaut since 1980. Mission special is Dr. James Bagian. This is also his first flight. He's been an astronaut since 1981. He will be working along with Mission Specialist Robert Springer to help deploy that tracking and data relay satellite that we've been speaking about. This is his first flight. Mission Specialist uh, James Bookley is also on the flight. This is uh, his third shuttle mission. He um, was a Mission Specialist on the first Department of Defense flight, which got off the ground in January of 1985. He was also part of the West German shuttle flight mission which was uh, back in November of 1985. Also on board is Mission Specialist Robert Springer. This is his first space flight. He'll be working to help deploy that um, tracking and data relay satellite. He has been uh, very involved in the redesign and certification review of the space shuttle since the uh, Challenger disaster in January of 1986. We're right now about seven and a half minutes into the flight of the Challenger. The next uh, important moment comes about one minute from now when the external tank will separate the large tank, which is uh, actually from your point of view, on top of the shuttle, uh, the uh, shuttle, of course, uh, travels in an upside-down position. The astronauts are basically on their back as they're uh, proceeding uh, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. They're at an altitude of about 58 miles above the Earth. Uh, the main engine will be cutting off at about 8.33, 8 minutes and 33 seconds into the flight. Everything seems to be going smoothly. We've heard nothing to the contrary from uh, NASA control, Bob. Well, that's absolutely true. This, this mission is working exactly according to plan, and it may be that the shuttle program, do you think, is going to get on the point where it will become routine? Do you think shuttles will ever become routine? There was a lot of talk about that before Challenger. I don't believe they'll ever be routine, So each one has its own characteristics. You have to be as careful with the next as you are with this one. It'll never be routine, but you hope it becomes more repetitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to get back on schedule. This is the year, and things are looking very good. Yeah, they're coming right up now on main engine cutoff of MECO is the NASA acronym for that. Okay, uh, we have had main engine, engine cutoff. The next uh, milestone will be the external tank separation, as you mentioned. That falls into the Indian Ocean after it burns up in small pieces. That's the only part of the shuttle that is not uh, reusable. Deborah? Bob, as, you, as we look at our animation that we prepared here, you see that the shuttle is actually pitching in a different attitude. This is something new with the shuttle program. The Discovery is, is pitching so that the uh, astronauts on board can actually take a picture of the um, external tank as it falls off. 
There were some problems, as you'll recall, with the Atlanta space flight in December of 1988. They suspect that some pieces of the external tank, perhaps some insulation, may have come off and uh, in separating damage, some of those heat-resistant tiles, which are vital to the um, uh, ability of the uh, shuttle to uh, devour any of the negative effects of the heat during uh, re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. So uh, they will be taking pictures. That'll be part of the data that is picked up during the flight. And uh, I imagine that is something that'll be closely scrutinized. Al O'Hara can tell us more about that. Well, that's right, Deborah. The, the tiles are a very important, not on ascent, but on re-entry. But they usually get damaged when the, when the shuttle goes up. And that's what happened, apparently, with Atlantis. It wasn't serious enough to cause any problems on re-entry, but it's something that they looked at very seriously. Now, what was the main uh, idea about Was it the external tank that caused the, the tile damage? Well, you can't be sure. There's no photographic coverage that covers that, but they suspect that it's a, a, a cork material from the, ex from the solid rocket boosters that actually peeled off and impacted the orbiter. At high velocity, just a very small object can do considerable damage to the tile. So this was inspected, all repaired. Don't expect the same problem this thing. Okay, I understand, Deborah, you're going to show us some pictures of that beautiful launch once again. We were. There were certainly no problems with the launch. The shuttle Discovery got off the ground at 9.57 a.m. this morning, the 28th launch of the shuttle program for NASA, and it was a picture-perfect launch after a bit of a delay this morning. Lift off of SPS-29 as Discovery clears the tower. A Roger roll, Discovery. Mission Control Houston, good roll program confirmed. position when the shuttle uh, essentially hangs from the uh, rockets which uh, thrusting it into the atmosphere. This Ladies is a video tape. About 30 about seconds into the launch. This launch was delayed by uh, nearly two hours of a delay because of high winds aloft and fog that was uh, surrounding the Cape early this morning, but the fog managed to clear and just before 10 o'clock. The shuttle was off. Roger, Mission Control, that call means all systems are performing well as the shuttle main engines have resumed their uh, firing at 104% of rated thrust. Relative velocity now 2,400 feet per second. Climbing at a rate of 1,700 feet per second. Downrange distance 11 nautical miles. The shuttle has now been in the air for approximately uh, 12 minutes. And uh, the next order of business for the shuttle will be the deployment of a tracking and data relay satellite. That'll happen about six hours into the mission. You're looking at a videotape of the launch of the Discovery Shuttle at approximately 9.57 a.m. Eastern Time this morning. And that was it, the Discovery launch, the 28th launch of the shuttle program, the first launch for 1988, the first of what NASA planned as seven launches of the shuttle program. This it is an ambitious schedule, and it has gotten off to a fine start this morning. NBC News coverage of the shuttle Discovery flight will continue later through the day, and of course on NBC Nightly News. My thanks to my colleague Bob Bazell and Al O'Hara at Cape Canaveral in Florida this morning, and our thanks to you for watching. Stay tuned to NBC News for more developments. I'm Deborah Norville, NBC News, New York. This has been an NBC News special report. We now rejoin the program already in progress.